9.11a. Darish Ako's Wedding. Weddings were celebrated lavishly in the imperial household. In 1633 the wedding of Darish Ako and Nadara, the daughter of Prince Perwes, was arranged by Princess Hahanara and Sadi Anisa Khanum, the chief maid of the late Empress, Mumtaz Mahal. An exhibition of the wedding gifts was arranged in the Diwani Am. In the afternoon the emperor and the ladies of the harem paid a visit to it, and in the evening nobles were allowed access. The bride's mother similarly arranged her presence in the same hall and Shah Jahan went to see them. The Hinabandi, application of Hanadai, ceremony was performed in the Diwani cause. Beetle leaf, pawn, cardamom, and dry fruit were distributed among the attendants of the court. The total cost of the wedding was Rs 32 lakh, of which Rs 6 lakh was contributed by the imperial treasury, Rs 16 lakh by Hahanara, including the amount earlier set aside by Mumtaz Mahal, and the rest by the bride's mother. These paintings from the Bad Shah 5 AMA depict some of the activities associated with the occasion. The Mughal Nobility This is how Chandrabhan Bahraman described the Mughal nobility in his book Char Kaman, 4. Gardens, written during the reign of Shah Jahan. People from many races, Arabs, Iranians, Turks, Tajiks, Kurds, Tatars, Russians, Abyssinians, and so on, and from many countries, Turkey, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Arabia, Iran, Khurasan, Turin, in fact, different groups and classes of people from all societies have sought refuge in the imperial court, as well as different groups from India, men with knowledge and skills as well as warriors, for example, Bukharis and Bakaris. Sayyads of genuine lineage, Sheikhzadas with noble ancestry, Afghan. Tribes such as the Lodis, Rohilas, Yusufzai, and castes of Rajputs, who were to be addressed as Rana, Raja, Rao, and Ryan i.e. Rather, Sisodia, Kishwaha, Hatta, Gar, Chahan, Panwar, Baduria, Salanki, Bundala, Shekawat, and all the other Indian tribes, such as Gakar, Kokar, Baluchi, and others who wielded the sword and mansabs from 100 to 7,000 zat, likewise landowners from the steppes and mountains, from the regions of Karnataka, Bengal, Assam, Udaipur, Srinagar, Kuman, Tibet, and Kishtwar and so on whole tribes and groups of them have been privileged to kiss the threshold of the imperial court, i.e. attend the court or find employment. Source 3. Abels at Court. The Jesuit priest Father Antonio Montserrat resident at the court of Akbar, noticed. In order to prevent the great nobles becoming insolent through the unchallenged enjoyment of power, the king summons them to court and gives them imperious commands, as though they were his slaves. The obedience to these commands ill suits their exalted rank and dignity. Figure 9.16 Jahangir's Dream an inscription on this miniature records that Jahangir commissioned Abu al-Hasan to render in painting a dream the emperor had had recently. Abu al-Hasan painted this scene portraying the two rulers Jahangir and the Saif Avid Shah Abbas in friendly embrace. Both kings are depicted in their traditional costumes. The figure of the Shah is based upon portraits made by Bish Andas who accompanied the Mughal embassy to Iran in 1613. This gave a sense of authenticity to a scene which is fictional, as the two rulers had never met. The Accessible Emperor In the account of his experiences, Montserrat, who was a member of the first Jesuit mission, says. It is hard to exaggerate how accessible he, Akbar, makes himself to all who wish audience of him. For he creates an opportunity almost every day for any of the common people or of the nobles to see him and to converse with him and he endeavors to show himself pleasant spoken and affable rather than severe towards all who come to speak with him. It is very remarkable how great an effect this courtesy and affability has in attaching him to the minds of his subjects. Ham in the Harem This is an excerpt from Abdul Qadir Bada Yunus Muntaka Buttawarik. A theologian and a courtier, Badani was critical of his employer's policies and did not wish to make the contents of his book public. From early youth, in compliment to his wives, the daughters of Rajas of Hind, His Majesty had been performing Ham in the harem, which is a ceremony derived from fire worship, Adishparasti. But on the new year of the 25th regnal year, 
1578, he prostrated publicly before the sun and the fire. In the evening the whole court had to rise up respectfully when the lamps and candles were lighted. Theme 10. Colonialism and the Countryside Exploring Official Archives In this chapter you will see what colonial rule meant to those who lived in the countryside. You will meet the Zamindars of Bengal, travel to the Rajmahal Hills where the Paharias and the Santhals lived, and then move west to the Deccan. You will look at the way the English East India Company, EIC, established its Raj in the countryside, implemented its revenue policies what these policies meant to different sections of people, and how they changed everyday lives. Laws introduced by the state have consequences for people, they determine to an extent who grows richer and who poorer, who acquires new land and who loses the land they have lived on, where peasants go when they need money. As you will see, however, people were not only subject to the working of laws, they also resisted the law by acting according to what they believed to be just. In doing so people defined the way in which laws operated, thereby modifying their consequences. You will also come to know about the sources that tell us about these histories, and the problems historians face in interpreting them. You will read about revenue records and surveys, journals and accounts left by surveyors and travelers, and reports produced by inquiry commissions. 1. Bengal and the Zamindars As you know, Colonial rule was first established in Bengal. It is here that the earliest attempts were made to reorder rural society and establish a new regime of land rights and a new revenue system. Let us see what happened in Bengal in the early years of company, EIC, rule. 1.1 1 .1 An auction in Burdwan In 1797 there was an auction in Burdwan, present-day Bardhaman. It was a big public event. A number of mahals, estates, held by the Raja of Burdwan were being sold. The permanent settlement had come into operation in 1793. The East India Company had fixed the revenue that each Zami Ndar had to pay. The estates of those who failed to pay were to be auctioned to recover the revenue. Since the Raja had accumulated huge arrears, his estates had been put up for auction. Numerous purchasers came to the auction and the estates were sold to the highest bidder. But the collector soon discovered a strange twist to the tale. Many of the purchasers turned out to be servants and agents of the Raja who had bought the lands on behalf of their master. Over 95% of the sale at the auction was fictitious. The Raja's estates had been publicly sold, but he remained in control of his Zamindari. Why had the Raja failed to pay the revenue? Who were the purchasers at the auction? What does the story tell us about what was happening in the rural areas of eastern India at that time? 1.2 The problem of unpaid revenue The estates of the Burdwan Raj were not the only ones sold during the closing years of the 18th century. Over 75% of the Zamindaris changed hands after the permanent settlement. In introducing the permanent settlement, British officials hoped to resolve the problems they had been facing since the conquest of Bengal. By the 1770s, the rural economy in Bengal was in crisis, with recurrent famines and declining agricultural output. Officials felt that agriculture, trade and the revenue resources of the state could all be developed by encouraging investment in agriculture. This could be done by securing rights of property and permanently fixing the rates of revenue demand. If the revenue demand of the state was permanently fixed, then the company could look forward to a regular flow of revenue, while entrepreneurs could feel sure of earning a profit from their investment, since the state would not siphon it off by increasing its claim. The process, officials hoped, would lead to the emergence of a class of yeoman farmers and rich landowners who would have the capital and enterprise to improve agriculture. Nurtured by the British, this class would also be loyal to the company. The problem, however, lay in identifying individuals who could both improve agriculture and contract to pay the fixed revenue to the state. After a prolonged debate amongst company officials, the permanent settlement was made with the Rajas and Talukdars of Bengal. They were now classified as Zamindars, and they had to pay the revenue demand that was fixed in perpetuity. In terms of this definition, the Zami Ndar was not a landowner in the village, 
but a revenue collector of the state. Zamindars had several, sometimes as many as 400, villages under them. In company calculations the villages within one Zamindari formed one revenue estate. The company fixed the total demand over the entire estate whose revenue the Zami Ndar contracted to pay. The Zami Ndar collected rent from the different villages, paid the revenue to the company, and retained the difference as his income. He was expected to pay the company regularly, failing which his estate could be auctioned. 1.3 Y Zamindars defaulted on payments. Company officials felt that a fixed revenue demand would give Zamindars a sense of security and, assured of returns on their investment, encourage them to improve their estates. In the early decades after the permanent settlement, however, Zamindars regularly failed to pay the revenue demand and unpaid balances accumulated. The reasons for this failure were various. First, the initial demands were very high. This was because it was felt that if the demand was fixed for all time to come, the company would never be able to claim a share of increased income from land when prices rose and cultivation expanded. To minimize this anticipated loss, the company pegged the revenue demand high, arguing that the burden on Zamindars would gradually decline as agricultural production expanded and prices rose. Second, this high demand was imposed in the 1790s, a time when the prices of agricultural produce were depressed, making it difficult for the riots to pay their dues to the Zami Ndar. If the Zami Ndar could not collect the rent, how could he pay the company? Third, the revenue was invariable, regardless of the harvest, and had to be paid punctually. In fact, according to the Sunset Law, if payment did not come in by sunset of the specified date, the Zamindari was liable to be auctioned. Fourth, the permanent settlement initially limited the power of the Zami Ndar to collect rent from the riot and manage his Zamindari. The company had recognized the Zamindars as important, but it wanted to control and regulate them, subdue their authority and restrict their autonomy. The Zamindars' troops were disbanded, customs duties abolished, and their cutcheries, courts, brought under the supervision of a collector appointed by the company. Zamindars lost their power to organize local justice and the local police. Over time the collectorate emerged as an alternative center of authority, severely restricting what the Zami Ndar could do. In one case, when a Raja failed to pay the revenue, a company official was speedily dispatched to his Zamindari with explicit instructions to take charge of the district and to use the most effectual means to destroy all the influence and the authority of the Raja and his officers. At the time of rent collection, an officer of the Zami Ndar, usually the Amla, came around to the village. But rent collection was a perennial problem. Sometimes bad harvests and low prices made payment of dues difficult for the riots. At other times riots deliberately delayed payment. Rich riots and village head Manyadars and Mondals were only too happy to see the Zami Ndar in trouble. The Zami Ndar could therefore not easily assert his power over them. Zamindars could prosecute defaulters, but the judicial process was long drawn. In Burdwan alone there were over 30,000 pending suits for arrears of rent payment in 1798. 1 1.4 The Rise of the Yadars While many Zamindars were facing a crisis at the end of the 18th century, a group of rich peasants were consolidating their position in the villages. In Francis Buchanan's survey of the Dinajpur district in North Bengal we have a vivid description of this class of rich peasants known as Yadars. By the early 19th century, Yadars had acquired vast areas of land sometimes as much as several thousand acres. They controlled local trade as well as money lending, exercising immense power over the poorer cultivators of the region. A large part of their land was cultivated through sharecroppers, adiyars or bargadars, who brought their own plows, labored in the field, and handed over half the produce to the Yadars after the harvest. Within the villages, the power of Yadars was more effective than that of Zamindars. Unlike Zamindars who often lived in urban areas, Yadars were located in the villages and exercised direct control over a considerable section of poor villagers. They fiercely resisted efforts by Zamindars to increase the jama of the village prevented Zamindari officials from executing their duties, mobilized riots who were dependent on them, 
and deliberately delayed payments of revenue to the Zami Ndar. In fact, when the estates of the Zamindars were auctioned for failure to make revenue payment, Yuddars were often amongst the purchasers. The Yuddars were most powerful in North Bengal, although rich peasants and village headmen were emerging as commanding figures in the countryside in other parts of Bengal as well. In some places they were called Hyaladars, elsewhere they were known as Gantidas or Mandals. Their rise inevitably weakened Zamindari authority. 1.5 The Zamindars resist. The authority of the Zamindars in rural areas, however, did not collapse. Faced with an exorbitantly high revenue demand and possible auction of their estates, they devised ways of surviving the pressures. New contexts produced new strategies. Fictitious sale was one such strategy. It involved a series of maneuvers. The Raja of Burdwan, for instance, first transferred some of his Zamindari to his mother, since the company had decreed that the property of women would not be taken over. Then, as a second move, his agents manipulated the auctions. The revenue demand of the company was deliberately withheld, and unpaid balances were allowed to accumulate. When a part of the estate was auctioned, the Zamindar's men bought the property, outbidding other purchasers. Subsequently they refused to pay up the purchase money, so that the estate had to be resold. Once again it was bought by the Zamindar's agents, once again the purchase money was not paid, and once again there was an auction. This process was repeated endlessly, exhausting the state, and the other bidders at the auction. At last the estate was sold at a low price back to the Zami Ndar. The Zami Ndar never paid the full revenue demand, the company rarely recovered the unpaid balances that had piled up. Such transactions happened on a grand scale. Between 1793 and 1801 four big Zamindaris of Bengal, including Burdwan, made Banami purchases that collectively yielded as much as Rs 30 lakh. Of the total sales at the auctions, over 15 percenter were fictitious. There were other ways in which Zamindars circumvented displacement. When people from outside the Zamindari bought an estate at an auction, they could not always take possession. At times their agents would be attacked by Lathyals of the former Zami Ndar. Sometimes even the riots resisted the entry of outsiders. They felt bound to their own Zami Ndar through a sense of loyalty and perceived him as a figure of authority and themselves as his proja, subjects. The sale of the Zamindari disturbed their sense of identity, their pride. The Zamindars therefore were not easily displaced. By the beginning of the 19th century the depression in prices was over. Thus those who had survived the troubles of the 1790s consolidated their power. Rules of revenue payment were also made somewhat flexible. As a result, the Zamindars' power over the villages was strengthened. It was only during the Great Depression of the 1930s that they finally collapsed and the Yuddars consolidated their power in the countryside. 1.6 The Fifth Report Many of the changes we are discussing were documented in detail in a report that was submitted to the British Parliament in 1813. It was the fifth of a series of reports on the administration and activities of the East India Company in India. Often referred to as the fifth report, it ran into 1,002 pages, of which over 800 pages were appendices that reproduced petitions of zamindars and riots, reports of collectors from different districts statistical tables on revenue returns, and notes on the revenue and judicial administration of Bengal and Madras, present-day Tamil Nadu, written by officials. From the time the company established its rule in Bengal in the MID 1760s, its activities were closely watched and debated in England. There were many groups in Britain who were opposed to the monopoly that the East India Company had over trade with India and China. These groups wanted a revocation of the royal charter that gave the company this monopoly. An increasing number of private traders wanted a share in the India trade, and the industrialists of Britain were keen to open up the Indian market for British manufacturers. Many political groups argued that the conquest of Bengal was benefiting only the East India Company but not the British nation as a whole. Information about company misrule and maladministration was hotly debated in Britain and incidents of the greed and corruption of company officials were widely publicized in the press. 
The British Parliament passed a series of acts in the late 18th century to regulate and control company rule in India. It forced the company to produce regular reports on the administration of India and appointed committees to inquire into the affairs of the company. The fifth report was one such report produced by a select committee. It became the basis of intense parliamentary debates on the nature of the East India Company's rule in India. For over a century and a half, the fifth report has shaped our conception of what happened in rural Bengal in the late 18th century. The evidence contained in the fifth report is invaluable. But official reports like this have to be read carefully. We need to know who wrote the reports and why they were written. In fact, recent researches show that the arguments and evidence offered by the fifth report cannot be accepted uncritically. Researchers have carefully examined the archives of various Bengal zamindars and the local records of the districts to write about the history of colonial rule in rural Bengal. They indicate that, intent on criticizing the maladministration of the company, the fifth report exaggerated the collapse of traditional zamindari power as also overestimated the scale on which zamindars were losing their land. As we have seen, even when zamindaris were auctioned, zamindars were not always displaced, given the ingenious methods they used to retain their zamindaris. 2. The hoe and the plough. Let us now shift our focus from the wetlands of Bengal to drier zones, from a region of settled cultivation to one where shifting agriculture was practiced. You will see the changes that came about when the frontiers of the peasant economy expanded outwards, swallowing up pastures and forests in the Rajmahal hills. You will also see how these changes created a variety of conflicts within the region. 2.1 In the hills of Rajmahal In the early 19th century, Buchanan traveled through the Rajmahal hills. From his description, the hills appeared impenetrable, a zone where few travelers ventured, an area that signified danger. Wherever he went, people were hostile, apprehensive of officials and unwilling to talk to them. In many instances they deserted their villages and absconded. Who were these hill folk? Why were they so apprehensive of Buchanan's visit? Buchanan's journal gives us tantalizing glimpses of these hill folk in the early 19th century. His journal was written as a diary of places he visited, people he encountered, and practices he saw. It raises questions in our mind, but does not always help us answer them. It tells us about a moment in time, but not about the longer history of people and places. For that historians have to turn to other records. If we look at Lati 18th century revenue records, we learn that these hill folk were known as Paharias. They lived around the Rajmahal hills, subsisting on forest produce and practicing shifting cultivation. They cleared patches of forest by cutting bushes and burning the undergrowth. On these patches, enriched by the potash from the ash, the Paharias grew a variety of pulses and millets for consumption. They scratched the ground lightly with hoes, cultivated the cleared land for a few years, then left it fallow so that it could recover its fertility, and moved to a new area. From the forests they collected mahua, a flower for food, silk cocoons, and resin for sale, and wood for charcoal production. The undergrowth that spread like a mat below the trees and the patches of grass that covered the land's left fallow provided pasture for cattle. The life of the Paharias as hunters, shifting cultivators, food gatherers, charcoal producers, silkworm rearers was thus intimately connected to the forest. They lived in hutments within tamarind groves, and rested in the shade of mango trees. They considered the entire region as their land, the basis their identity as well as survival, and they resisted the intrusion of outsiders. Their chiefs maintained the unity of the group, settled disputes, and led the tribe in battles with other tribes and plains people. With their base in the hills, the Paharias regularly raided the plains where settled agriculturists lived. These raids were necessary for survival, particularly in years of scarcity they were a way of asserting power over settled communities, and they were a means of negotiating political relations with outsiders. The Zamindars on the plains had to often purchase peace by paying a regular tribute to the hill chiefs. Traders similarly gave a small amount to the hill folk for permission to use the passes controlled by them. Once the toll was paid, the Paharia chiefs protected the traders, 
ensuring that their goods were not plundered by anyone. This negotiated peace was somewhat fragile. It broke down in the last decades of the 18th century when the frontiers of settled agriculture were being aggressively extended in eastern India. The British encouraged forest clearance and zamindars and yadars turned uncultivated lands into rice fields. To the British, extension of settled agriculture was necessary to enlarge the sources of land revenue, produce crops for export, and establish the basis of a settled, ordered society. They also associated forests with wildness, and saw forest people as savage, unruly, primitive, and difficult to govern. So they felt that forests had to be cleared, settled agriculture established, and forest people tamed, civilized and persuaded to give up hunting and take to plow agriculture. As settled agriculture expanded, the area under forests and pastures contracted. This sharpened the conflict between hillfolk and settled cultivators. The former began to raid settled villages with increasing regularity, carrying away food grains and cattle. Exasperated colonial officials tried desperately to control and subdue the Pajarias. But they found the task difficult. In the 1770s the British embarked on a brutal policy of extermination, hunting the Pajarias down and killing them. Then, by the 1780s, Augustus Cleveland, the collector of Bogalpur, proposed a policy of pacification. Pajaria chiefs were given an annual allowance and made responsible for the proper conduct of their men. They were expected to maintain order in their localities and discipline their own people. Many Pajaria chiefs refused the allowances. Those who accepted, most often lost authority within the community. Being in the pay of the colonial government, they came to be perceived as subordinate employees or stipendiary chiefs. As the pacification campaigns continued, the Pajarias withdrew deep into the mountains, insulating themselves from hostile forces, and carrying on a war with outsiders. So when Buchanan traveled through the region in the winter of 1810 to 1811 the Pajarias naturally viewed him with suspicion and distrust. The experience of pacification campaigns and memories of brutal repression shaped their perception of British infiltration into the area. Every white man appeared to represent a power that was destroying their way of life and means of survival, snatching away their control over their forests and lands. By this time in fact there were newer intimations of danger. Sand halls were pouring into the area, clearing forests, cutting down timber, plowing land, and growing rice and cotton. As the lower hills were taken over by Santhal settlers, the Pajarias receded deeper into the Rajmahal hills. If Pajaria life was symbolized by the hoe, which they used for shifting cultivation, the settlers came to represent the power of the plough. The battle between the hoe and the plough was a long one. 2.2 The Sand Halls, Pioneer Settlers At the end of 1810, Buchanan crossed Ganjaria Pahar, which was part of the Rajmahal Ranges, passed through the rocky country beyond, and reached a village. It was an old village but the land around had been recently cleared to extend cultivation. Looking at the landscape, Buchanan found evidence of the region having been transformed through proper application of human labor. He wrote, Gunjaria is just sufficiently cultivated to show what a glorious country this might be made. I think its beauty and riches might be made equal to almost any in the universe. The soil here was rocky but uncommonly fine and nowhere had Buchanan seen finer tobacco and mustard. On inquiry he discovered that the frontiers of cultivation here had been extended by the sand halls. They had moved into this area around 1800, displaced the hillfolk who lived on these lower slopes, cleared the forests and settled the land. How did the sand halls reach the Rajmahal hills? The sand halls had begun to come into Bengal. Around the 1780s, Zamindars hired them to reclaim land and expand cultivation, and British officials invited them to settle in the Jangal Mahals. Having failed to subdue the Pajarias and transform them into settled agriculturists, the British turned to the Sand Halls. The Pajarias refused to cut forests, resisted touching the plough, and continued to be turbulent. The Sand Halls, by contrast, appeared to be ideal settlers, clearing forests and ploughing the land with vigour. 
the Sandhals were given land and persuaded to settle in the foothills of Rajmahal. By 1832 a large area of land was demarcated as Damini Koh. This was declared to be the land of the Sandhals. They were to live within it, practice plough agriculture, and become settled peasants. The land grant to the Sandhals stipulated that at least one-tenth of the area was to be cleared and cultivated within the first ten years. The territory was surveyed and mapped. Enclosed with boundary pillars, it was separated from both the world of the settled agriculturists of the plains and the Pajarias of the hills. After the demarcation of Damini Koh, Santhal settlements expanded rapidly. From 40 Santhal villages in the area Indiana 1838, as many as 1473 villages had come up by 1851. Over the same period, the Santhal population increased from a mere 3,000 to over 82,000. As cultivation expanded, an increased volume of revenue flowed into the company's coffers. Santhal myths and songs of the 19th century refer very frequently to a long history of travel, they represent the Santhal past as one of continuous mobility, a tireless search for a place to settle. Here in the Damini Koh their journey seemed to have come to an end. When the Santhals settled on the peripheries of the Rajmahal hills, the Pajarias resisted but were ultimately forced to withdraw deeper into the hills. Restricted from moving down to the lower hills and valleys, they were confined to the dry interior and to the more barren and rocky upper hills. This severely affected their lives, impoverishing them in the long term. Shifting agriculture depended on the ability to move to newer and newer land and utilization of the natural fertility of the soil. When the most fertile soils became inaccessible to them, being part of the daemon, the Pajarias could not effectively sustain their mode of cultivation. When the forests of the region were cleared for cultivation the hunters amongst them also faced problems. The Sandhals, by contrast, gave up their earlier life of mobility and settled down cultivating a range of commercial crops for the market, and dealing with traders and money lenders. The Sandhals, however, soon found that the land they had brought under cultivation was slipping away from their hands. The state was levying heavy taxes on the land that the Sandhals had cleared, money lenders, dikas, were charging them high rates of interest and taking over the land when debts remained unpaid, and zamindars were asserting control over the daemon area. By the 1850s, the Sandhals felt that the time had come to rebel against Zamindars, money lenders, and the colonial state, in order to create an ideal world for themselves where they would rule. It was after the Santhal Revolt, 1855 to 1856, that the Santhal Pargana was created, carving out 5,500 square miles from the districts of Bhagalpur and Burbam. The colonial state hoped that by creating a new territory for the Santhals and imposing some special laws within it, the Santhals could be conciliated. 2.3 The Accounts of Buchanan We have been drawing on Buchanan's account, but while reading his reports we should not forget that he was an employee of the British East India Company. His journeys were not simply inspired by the love of landscape and the desire to discover the unknown. He marched everywhere with a large army of people draftsmen, surveyors, palanquin bearers, coolies. The costs of the travels were borne by the East India Company since it needed the information that Buchanan was expected to collect. Buchanan had specific instructions about what he had to look for and what he had to record. When he arrived at a village with his army of people, he was immediately perceived as an agent of the Sarkar. As the company consolidated its power and expanded its commerce, it looked for natural resources it could control and exploit. It surveyed landscapes and revenue sources, organized voyages of discovery, and sent its geologists and geographers, its botanists and medical men to collect information. Buchanan, undoubtedly an extraordinary observer, was one such individual. Everywhere Buchanan went, he obsessively observed the stones and rocks and the different strata and layers of soil. He searched for minerals and stones that were commercially valuable, he recorded all signs of iron ore and mica, granite, and salt petri. He carefully observed local practices of salt making and irona emining. When Buchanan wrote about a landscape, 
he most often described not just what he saw, what the landscape was like, but also how it could be transformed and made more productive what crops could be cultivated, which trees cut down, and which ones grown. And we must remember that his vision and his priorities were different from those of the local inhabitants, his assessment of what was necessary was shaped by the commercial concerns of the company and modern Western notions of what constituted progress. He was inevitably critical of the lifestyles of forest dwellers and felt that forests had to be turned into agricultural lands. 3. A Revolt in the Countryside The Bombay Deccan You have read about how the lives of peasants and zamindars of colonial Bengal and the Paharias and Santhals of the Rajmahal Hills were changing. Now let us move across to western India, and to a later period, and explore what was happening in the countryside in the Bombay Deccan. One way of exploring such changes is by focusing on a peasant revolt. In such climactic times, rebels express their anger and fury, they rise against what they perceive to be injustice and the causes of their suffering. If we try to understand the premises of their resentment, and peel the layers of their anger, we get a glimpse of their life and experience that is otherwise hidden from us. Revolts also produce records that historians can look at. Alarmed by the actions of rebels and keen on restoring order, state authorities do not simply repress a rebellion. They try and understand it, inquire into its causes so that policies can be formulated and peace established. These inquiries produce evidence that historians can explore. Through the 19th century, peasants in various parts of India rose in revolt against moneylenders and grain dealers. One such revolt occurred in 1875 in the Deccan. 3.1 account books are burnt. The movement began at Supa, a large village in Pune, present-day Pun, district. It was a market center where many shopkeepers and moneylenders lived. On 12 MAY 1875, riots from surrounding rural areas gathered and attacked the shopkeepers, demanding their Bahi katas, account books, and debt bonds. They burnt the katas, looted grain shops, and in some cases set fire to the houses of Sahu Kars. From Pune the revolt spread to Ahmednagar. Then over the next two months it spread even further, over an area of 6,500 square km. More than 30 villages were affected. Everywhere the pattern was the same, Sahu Kars were attacked, account books burnt and debt bonds destroyed. Terrified of peasant attacks, the Sahu Kars fled the villages, very often leaving their property and belongings behind. As the revolt spread, British officials saw the specter of 1857. Police posts were established in villages to frighten rebellious peasants into submission. Troops were quickly called in, 951 people were arrested, and many convicted. But it took several months to bring the countryside under control. Why the burning of bonds and deeds? Why this revolt? What does it tell us about the Deccan? Countryside and about agrarian changes under colonial rule? Let us look at this longer history of changes over the 19th century. 3.2 A New Revenue System As British rule expanded from Bengal to other parts of India, new systems of revenue were imposed. The permanent settlement was rarely extended to any region beyond Bengal. Why was this so? One reason was that after 1810, agricultural prices rose, increasing the value of harvest produce, and enlarging the income of the Bengal zamindars. Since the revenue demand was fixed under the permanent settlement, the colonial state could not claim any share of this enhanced income. Keen on expanding its financial resources, the colonial government had to think of ways to maximize its land revenue. So in territories annexed in the 19th century, temporary revenue settlements were made. There were other reasons too. When officials devise policies, their thinking is deeply shaped by economic theories they are familiar with. By the 1820s, the economist David Ricardo was a celebrated figure in England. Colonial officials had learned Ricardian ideas during their college years. In Maharashtra when British officials set about formulating the terms of the early settlement in the 1820s, they operated with some of these ideas. According to Ricardian ideas, 
a landowner should have a claim only to the average rent that prevailed at a given time. When the land yielded more than this average rent, the landowner had a surplus that the state needed to tax. If tax was not levied, cultivators were likely to turn into rentiers, and their surplus income was unlikely to be productively invested in the improvement of the land. Many British officials in India thought that the history of Bengal confirmed Ricardo's theory. There the zamindars seemed to have turned into rentiers, leasing out land and living on the rental incomes. It was therefore necessary, the British officials now felt, to have a different system. The revenue system that was introduced in the Bombay Deccan came to be known as the Riotwari. Settlement Unlike the Bengal system, the revenue was directly settled with the riot. The average income from different types of soil was estimated, the revenue paying capacity of the riot was assessed and a proportion of it fixed as the share of the state. The lands were resurveyed every 30 years and the revenue rates increased. Therefore the revenue demand was no longer permanent. 3.3 Revenue Demand and Peasant Debt The first revenue settlement in the Bombay Deccan was made in the 1820s. The revenue that was demanded was so high that in many places peasants deserted their villages and migrated to new regions. In areas of poor soil and fluctuating rainfall the problem was particularly acute. When rains failed and harvests were poor, peasants found it impossible to pay the revenue. However, the collectors in charge of revenue collection were keen on demonstrating their efficiency and pleasing their superiors. So they went about extracting payment with utmost severity. When someone failed to pay, his crops were seized and a fine was imposed on the whole village. By the 1830s the problem became more severe. Prices of agricultural products fell sharply after 1832 and did not recover for over a decade and a half. This meant a further decline in peasants' income. At the same time the countryside was devastated by a famine that struck in the years 1832 to 34. Onet heard of the cattle of the Deccan were killed, and half the human population died. Those who survived had no agricultural stocks to see them through the crisis. Unpaid balances of revenue mounted. How did cultivators live through such years? How did they pay the revenue, procure their consumption needs, purchase their plows and cattle, or get their children married? Inevitably, they borrowed. Revenue could rarely be paid without a loan from a money lender. But once a loan was taken, the riot found it difficult to pay it back. As debt mounted, and loans remained unpaid, peasants' dependence on money lenders increased. They now needed loans even to buy their everyday needs and meet their production expenditure. By the 1840s, officials were finding evidence of alarming levels of peasant indebtedness everywhere. By the MID 1840s there were signs of an economic recovery of sorts. Many British officials had begun to realize that the settlements of the 1820s had been harsh. The revenue demanded was exorbitant, the system rigid, and the peasant economy on the verge of collapse. So the revenue demand was moderated to encourage peasants to expand cultivation. After 1845 agricultural prices recovered steadily. Cultivators were now extending their acreage, moving into new areas, and transforming pasture land into cultivated fields. But to expand cultivation peasants needed more plows and cattle. They needed money to buy seeds and land. For all this they had to turn once again to money lenders for loans. 3.4 Then came the cotton boom. Before the 1860s, three-fourths of raw cotton imports into Britain came from America. British cotton manufacturers had for long been worried about this dependence on American supplies. What would happen if this source was cut off? Troubled by this question, they eagerly looked for alternative sources of supply. In 1857 the Cotton Supply Association was founded in Britain, and in 1859 the Manchester Cotton Company was formed. Their objective was to encourage cotton production in every part of the world suited for its growth. India was seen as a country that could supply cotton to Lancashire if the American supply dried up. It possessed suitable soil, a climate favorable to cotton cultivation, and cheap labor. 
When the American Civil War broke out in 1861, a wave of panic spread through cotton circles in Britain. Raw cotton imports from America fell to less than 3% of the normal, from over 2 million bales, of 400 pounds each, in 1861 to 55,000 bales in 1862. Frantic messages were sent to India and elsewhere to increase cotton exports to Britain. In Bombay, cotton merchants visited the cotton districts to assess supplies and encourage cultivation. As cotton prices soared, export merchants in Bombay were keen to secure as much cotton as possible to meet the British demand. So they gave advances to urban sahukars who in turn extended credit to those rural moneylenders who promised to secure the produce. When there is a boom in the market credit flows easily, for those who give out loans feel secure about recovering their money. These developments had a profound impact on the Deccan countryside. The riots in the Deccan villages suddenly found access to seemingly limitless credit. They were being given Rs 100 as advance for every acre they planted with cotton. Sahukars were more than willing to extend long-term loans. While the American crisis continued, Cotton production in the Bombay. Deccan expanded. Between 1860 and 1864 cotton acreage doubled. By 1862 over 90 percent of cotton imports into Britain were coming from India. But these boom years did not bring prosperity to all cotton producers. Some rich peasants did gain, but for the large majority, cotton expansion meant heavier debt. 5. Credit dries up. While the boom lasted, cotton merchants in India had visions of capturing the world market in raw cotton, permanently displacing America. The editor of the Bombay Gazette had asked in 1861, what can prevent India from supplanting the slave states, of USA, as the feeder of Lancashire. By 1865 these dreams were over. As the Civil War ended, Cotton production in America revived and Indian cotton exports to Britain steadily declined. Export merchants and sahukars in Maharashtra were no longer keen on extending long-term credit. They could see the demand for Indian cotton fall and cotton prices slide downwards. So they decided to close down their operations, restrict their advances to peasants, and demand repayment of outstanding debts. While credit dried up, the revenue demand increased. The first revenue settlement, as we have seen, was in the 1820s and 1830s. Now it was time for the next. And in the new settlement, the demand was increased dramatically, from 50 to 100 per center. How could riots pay this inflated demand at a time when prices were falling and cotton fields disappearing? Yet again they had to turn to the moneylender. But the moneylender now refused loans. He no longer had confidence in the riot's capacity to repay. 3.6 The experience of injustice. The refusal of moneylenders to extend loans enraged the riots. What infuriated them was not simply that they had got deeper and deeper into debt, or that they were utterly dependent on the moneylender for survival, but that moneylenders were being insensitive to their plight. The moneylenders were violating the customary norms of the countryside. Money lending was certainly widespread before colonial rule and money lenders were often powerful figures. A variety of customary norms regulated the relationship between the money lender and the riot. One general norm was that the interest charged could not be more than the principal. This was meant to limit the money lender's exactions and defined what could be counted as fair interest. Under colonial rule this norm broke down. In one of the many cases investigated by the Deccan Riots Commission, the moneylender had charged over Rs 2000 as interest on a loan of Rs 100. In petition after petition, riots complained of the injustice of such exactions and the violation of custom. The riots came to see the moneylender as devious and deceitful. They complained of moneylenders manipulating laws and forging accounts. In 1859 the British passed a limitation law that stated that the loan bonds signed between moneylenders and riots would have validity for only three years. This law was meant to check the accumulation of interest over time. The moneylender, however, turned the law around, 
forcing the riot to sign a new bond every three years. When a new bond was signed, the unpaid balance that is, the original loan and the accumulated interest was entered as the principal on which a new set of interest charges was calculated. In petitions that the Deccan Riots Commission collected, riots described how this process worked and how money lenders used a variety of other means to shortchange the riot, they refused to give receipts when loans were repaid, entered fictitious figures in bonds, acquired the peasants' harvest at low prices, and ultimately took over peasants' property. Deeds and bonds appeared as symbols of the new oppressive system. In the past such deeds had been rare. The British, however, were suspicious of transactions based on informal understanding, as was common in the past. The terms of transactions, they believed, had to be clearly, unambiguously and categorically stated in contracts, deeds and bonds, and regulated by law. Unless the deed or contract was legally enforceable, it had no value. Over time, peasants came to associate the misery of their lives with the new regime of bonds and deeds. They were made to sign and put thumb impressions on documents, but they did not know what they were actually signing. They had no idea of the clauses that money lenders inserted in the bonds. They feared the written word. But they had no choice because to survive they needed loans and money lenders were unwilling to give loans without legal bonds. 4. The Deccan Riots Commission When the revolt spread in the Deccan, the government of Bombay was initially unwilling to see it as anything serious. But the government of India, worried by the memory of 1857, press sunrised the government of Bombay to set up a commission of inquiry to investigate into the causes of the riots. The commission produced a report that was presented to the British Parliament in 1878. This report, referred to as the Deccan Riots Report, provides historians with a range of sources for the study of the riot. The commission held inquiries in the districts where the riots spread, recorded statements of riots, sahu cars, and eyewitnesses, compiled statistical data on revenue rates, prices, and interest rates in different regions and collated the reports sent by district collectors. In looking at such sources we have to again remember that they are official sources and reflect official concerns and interpretations of events. The Deccan Riots Commission, for instance, was specifically asked to judge whether the level of government revenue demand was the cause of the revolt. And after presenting all the evidence, the commission reported that the government demand was not the cause of peasant anger. It was the moneylenders who were to blame. This argument is found very frequently in colonial records. This shows that there was a persistent reluctance on the part of the colonial government to admit that popular discontent was ever on account of government action. Official reports, thus, are invaluable sources for the reconstruction of history. But they have to be always read with care and juxtaposed with evidence culled from newspapers, unofficial accounts, legal records and where possible, oral sources. Timeline 1765 English East India Company acquires Diwani of Bengal 1773 Regulating Act passed by the British Parliament to regulate the activities of the East India Company 1793 Permanent Settlement in Bengal 1800 Sandhals begin to come to the Rajmahal Hills and settle there 1818 First Revenue Settlement in the Bombay Deccan 1820s Agricultural Prices Begin to Fall 1840s to 1850s A Slow Process of Agrarian Expansion in the Bombay Deccan 1855 to 56 Santhal Rebellion 1861 Cotton Boom Begins 1875 Riots in Deccan Villages Rebel Talukdar literally means one who holds a taluk or a connection. Taluk came to refer to a territorial unit. Riot is the way the term rayat, used to designate peasants, was spelt in British records. Riots in Bengal did not always cultivate the land directly, but leased it out to under riots. Zamindars were responsible for 1. Paying revenue to the company. 2. Distributing the revenue demand. Jama, over villages. Each village riot, big or small, paid rent to the Zami Ndar. 
Yuddars gave out loans to other riots and sold their produce. Riots cultivated some land and gave out the rest to under riots on rent. Under riots paid rent to the riots. Source 1. I. The Yuddars of Dinajpur. Buchanan described the ways in which the Yuddars of Dinajpur in North Bengal resisted being disciplined by the Zami Ndar and undermined his power. Landlords do not like this class of men, but it is evident that they are absolutely necessary, unless the landlords themselves would advance money to their necessitous tenantry. The Yuddars who cultivate large portions of lands are very refractory, and know that the Zamindars have no power over them. They pay only a few rupees on account of their revenue and then fall in balance almost every kist, installment, they hold more lands than they are entitled to by their potas, deeds of contract. Should the Zamindar's officers, in consequence, summon them to the kuchari, and detain them for one or two hours with a view to reprimand them, they immediately go and complain at the Fuzdari Thana, police station, for imprisonment and at the Munsif S, a judicial officer at the lower court, Kuchari for being dishonored and whilst the causes continue unsettled, they instigate the petty riots not to pay their revenue consequently. Banami, literally anonymous, is a term used in Hindi and several other Indian languages for transactions made in the name of a fictitious or relatively insignificant person, whereas the real beneficiary remains unnamed. Lathiel, literally one who wields the lati or stick, functioned as a strongman of the Zami Ndar. Source 2 from the fifth report. Referring to the condition of Zamindars and the auction of lands, the fifth report stated. The revenue was not realized with punctuality, and lands to a considerable extent were periodically exposed to sale by auction. In the native year 1203, corresponding with 1796 to 1797, the land advertised for sale comprehended a jumma or assessment of Sikha rupees 28,70,061, the extent of land actually sold bore a jumma or assessment of 14,18,756, and the amount of purchase money Sikha rupees 17,90,416. In 1204, corresponding with 1797 to 1798, the land advertised was for Sikha rupees 26,66,191, the quantity sold was for Sikha rupees 22,74,076, and the purchase money Sikha rupees 21,47,580. Among the defaulters were some of the oldest families of the country. Such were the Rajas of Nudia, Rajas Hay, Bishanpur, all districts of Bengal, and others the dismemberment of whose estates at the end of each succeeding year, threatened them with poverty and ruin, and in some instances presented difficulties to the revenue officers, in their efforts to preserve undiminished the amount of public assessment. Who was Buchanan? Francis Buchanan was a physician who came to India and served in the Bengal Medical Service, from 1794 to 1815. For a few years he was surgeon to the Governor-General of India, Lord Wellesley. During his stay in Calcutta, present-day Kolkata, he organized a zoo that became the Calcutta Alipur Zoo, he was also in charge of the botanical gardens for a short period. On the request of the government of Bengal, he undertook detailed surveys of the areas under the jurisdiction of the British East India Company. In 1815 he fell ill and returned to England. Upon his mother's death, he inherited her property and assumed her family name Hamilton. So he is often called Buchanan Hamilton. Source 3. Buchanan on the Sand Halls. Buchanan wrote. They are very clever in clearing new lands, but live meanly. Their huts have no fence, and the walls are made of small sticks placed upright, closed together and plastered within with clay. They are small and slovenly and two flat-roofed, with very little arch. Source 4. The Rocks Near Katuya. Buchanan's journal is packed with observations like the following. About a mile farther on, I, came to a low ledge of rocks without any evident strata, it is a small grained granite with reddish feldspar, with quartz and black mica. More than half a mile from thence, I came to another rock not stratified, 
and consisting of very fine-grained granite with yellowish feldspar, whitish quartz, and black mica. Source 5. On Clearance and Settled Cultivation. Passing through one village in the lower Rajmahal Hills, Buchanan wrote. The view of the country is exceedingly fine, the cultivation, especially the narrow valleys of rice winding in all directions, the cleared lands with scattered trees, and the rocky hills are in perfection, all that is wanted is some appearance of progress in the area and a vastly extended and improved cultivation, of which the country is highly susceptible. Plantations of Asin and Paulus, Fortesser, Tasser silkworms, and Lac, should occupy the place of woods to as great an extent as the demand will admit, the remainder might be all cleared, and the greater part cultivated, while what is not fit for the purpose, might rear Plamara, Palmyra, and Maa, Mahua. Source 6. On that day in Supa. On May 16, 1875, the district magistrate of Pune wrote to the police commissioner. On arrival at Supa on Saturday May 15 I learned of the disturbance. One house of a moneylender was burnt down, about a dozen were forcibly broken into and completely gutted of their content. Account papers, bonds, grains, country cloth were burnt in the street where heaps of ashes are still to be seen. The chief constable apprehended 50 persons. Stolen property worth Rs 2,000 was recovered. The estimated loss is over Rs 25,000. Moneylenders claim it is over 1 lakh. DECCA 5 Riots Commissio 5 Asa Hooker was someone who acted as both a moneylender and a trader. Source 7 A Newspaper Report The following report, titled The Riot and the Moneylender, appeared in the 5 ATIV Opinion, June 6. 1876, and was quoted in report of the 5 ATIV 5 EU's papers of Bombay. They, the riots, first place spies on the boundaries of their villages to see if any government officers come, and to give timely intimation of their arrival to the offenders. They then assemble in a body and go to the houses of their creditors, and demand from them a surrender of their bonds and other documents, and threaten them in case of refusal with assault and plunder. If any government officer happens to approach the villages where the above is taking place, the spies give intimation to the offenders and the latter disperse in time. Rentier is a term used to designate people who live on rental income from property. Source 8. A Riot Petitions. This is an example of a petition from a riot of the village of Marajayan, Talyaka Karjit, to the collector. Ahmed Nugger, Deccan Riots Commission. The Saukars, Sahukars, have of late begun to oppress us. As we cannot earn enough to defray our household expenses, we are actually forced to beg of them to provide us with money, clothes, and grain, which we obtain from them not without great difficulty, nor without their compelling us to enter into hard conditions in the bond. Moreover the necessary clothes and grain are not sold to us at cash rates. The prices asked from us are generally 25 or 50 percent more than demanded from customers making ready money payments. The produce of our fields is also taken by the Saukers, who at the time of removing it assure us that it will be credited to our account, but they do not actually make any mention of it in the accounts. They also refuse to pass us any receipts for the produce so removed by them. Source 9. Deeds of Hire. When debts mounted the peasant was unable to pay back the loan to the money lender. He had no option but to give over all his possessions land, carts, and animals to the money lender. But without animals he could not continue to cultivate. So he took land on rent and animals on hire. He now had to pay for the animals which had originally belonged to him. He had to sign a deed of hire stating very clearly that these animals and carts did not belong to him. In cases of conflict, these deeds could be enforced through the court. The following is the text of a deed that a peasant signed in November 1873, from the records of the Deccan Riots Commission. I have sold to you, on account of the debt due to you, my two carriages having iron axles, with their appurtenances and four bullocks. I have taken from you on hire under, this, deed the very same two carriages and four bullocks. I shall pay every month the hire thereof at rupees for a month, and obtain a receipt in your own handwriting. 
In the absence of a receipt I shall not contend that the hire had been paid. Source 10. How debts mounted. In a petition to the Deccan Riots Commission a riot explained how the system of loans worked. A Sauker lends his debtor Rs 100 on bond at Rs 3 or 2 on as per center per mensum. The latter agrees to pay the amount within eight days from the passing of the bond. Three years after the stipulated time for repaying the amount, the Sauker takes from his debtor another bond for the principal and interest together at the same rate of interest, and allows him 125 days time to liquidate the debt. After the lapse of three years and 15 days a third bond is passed by the debtor. This process is repeated, at the end of 12 years, his interest on Rs 1000 amounts to Rs 2028 to 2010 on Rs 3 pays. Theme 11. Rebels and the Raj. The Revolt of 1857. And its representations. Late in the afternoon of May 10, 1857, the sepoys in the cantonment of Merit broke out in mutiny. It began in the lines of the native infantry spread very swiftly to the cavalry and then to the city. The ordinary people of the town and surrounding villages joined the sepoys. The sepoys captured the bell of arms where the arms and ammunition were kept and proceeded to attack white people, and to ransack and burn their bungalows and property. Government buildings the record office, jail, court, post office, treasury, etc. were destroyed and plundered. The telegraph line to Delhi was cut. As darkness descended, a group of sepoys rode off towards Delhi. The sepoys arrived at the gates of the Red Fort early in the morning on May 11. It was the month of Ramzan, the Muslim holy month of prayer and fasting. The old Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah, had just finished his prayers and meal before the sun rose and the fast began. He heard the commotion at the gates. The sepoys who had gathered under his window told him, we have come from Meerut after killing all the Englishmen there, because they asked us to bite bullets that were coated with the fat of cows and pigs with our teeth. This has corrupted the faith of Hindus and Muslims alike another group of sepoys also entered Delhi, and the ordinary people of the city joined them. Europeans were killed in large numbers, the rich of Delhi were attacked and looted. It was clear that Delhi had gone out of British control. Some sepoys rode into the Red Fort without observing the elaborate court etiquette expected of them. They demanded that the emperor give them his blessings. Surrounded by the sepoys, Bahadur Shah had no other option but to comply. The revolt thus acquired a kind of legitimacy because it could now be carried on in the name of the Mughal emperor. 1. Pattern of the Rebellion If one were to place the dates of these mutinies in chronological order, it would appear that as the news of the mutiny in one town travelled to the next the sepoys there took up arms. The sequence of events in every cantonment followed a similar pattern. 1.1 How the mutinies began The sepoys began their action with a signal, in many places it was the firing of the evening gun or the sounding of the bugle. They first seized the bell of arms and plundered the treasury. They then attacked government buildings the jail, treasury, telegraph office, record room, bungalows burning all records. Everything and everybody connected with the white man became a target. Proclamations in Hindi, Urdu and Persian were put up in the cities calling upon the population, both Hindus and Muslims, to unite, rise and exterminate the Firjis. When ordinary people began joining the revolt, the targets of attack widened. In major towns like Lucknow, Kanpur and Bareilly, Moneylenders and the rich also became the objects of rebel wrath. Peasants not only saw them as oppressors but also as allies of the British. In most places their houses were looted and destroyed. The mutiny in the sepoy ranks quickly became a rebellion. There was a general defiance of all kinds of authority and hierarchy. In the months of May and June, the British had no answer to the actions of the rebels. Individual Britons tried to save their own lives and the lives of their families. British rule, as one British officer noted, collapsed like a house made of cards. 1.2 Lines of Communication The reason for the similarity in the pattern of the revolt in different places lay partly in its planning and coordination. It is clear that there was communication between the sepoy lines of various cantonments. 
After the 7th Awad Irregular Cavalry had refused to accept the new cartridges in early May, they wrote to the 48th Native Infantry that they had acted for the faith and awaited the 4ATHS orders. Sepoys or their emissaries moved from one station to another. People were thus planning and talking about the rebellion. The pattern of the mutinies and the pieces of evidence that suggest some sort of planning and coordination raise certain crucial questions. How were the plans made? Who were the planners? It is difficult on the basis of the available documents to provide direct answers to such questions. But one incident provides clues as to how the mutinies came to be so organized. Captain Hirzi of the Awad military police had been given protection by his Indian subordinates during the mutiny. They 41st Native Infantry, which was stationed in the same place, insisted that since they had killed all their white officers, the military police should also kill Hirzi or deliver him as prisoner to the 41st. The military police refused to do either, and it was decided that the matter would be settled by a panchayat composed of native officers drawn from each regiment. Charles Ball, who wrote one of the earliest histories of the uprising, noted that panchayats were a nightly occurrence in the Kanpur sepoy lines. What this suggests is that some of the decisions were taken collectively. Given the fact that the sepoys lived in lines and shared a common lifestyle and that many of them came from the same caste, it is not difficult to imagine them sitting together to decide their own future. The sepoys were the makers of their own rebellion. 1.3 Leaders and Followers To fight the British, leadership and organization were required. For these the rebels sometimes turned to those who had been leaders before the British conquest. One of the first acts of the sepoys of Merit, as we saw, was to rush to Delhi and appeal to the old Mughal emperor to accept the leadership of the revolt. This acceptance of leadership took its time in coming. Bahadur Shah's first reaction was one of horror and rejection. It was only when some sepoys had moved into the Mughal court within the Red Fort, in defiance of normal court etiquette, that the old emperor, realizing he had very few options, agreed to be the nominal leader of the rebellion. Elsewhere, similar scenes were enacted though on a minor scale. In Kanpur, the sepoys and the people of the town gave Nana Sahib, the successor to Peshwa Beji Rao II, no choice save to join the revolt as their leader. In Jhansi, the Rani was forced by the popular pressure around her to assume the leadership of the uprising. So was Kun War Singh, a local Zami Ndar in Ara in Bihar. In Awad, where the displacement of the popular Nawab Wajid Ali Shah and the annexation of the state were still very fresh in the memory of the people, the populace in Lucknow celebrated the fall of British rule by hailing Burgess Khadr, the young son of the Nawab, as their leader. Not everywhere were the leaders people of the court Ranis, Rajas, Nawabs, and Talukdars. Often the message of rebellion was carried by ordinary men and women and in places by religious men too. From Meerut, there were reports that a fakir had appeared riding on an elephant and that the sepoys were visiting him frequently. In Lucknow, after the annexation of Awad, there were many religious leaders and self-styled prophets who preached the destruction of British rule. Elsewhere, Local leaders emerged, urging peasants, zamindars and tribals to revolt. Shamal mobilized the villagers of Pargana Baraut in Uttar Pradesh, Ganu, a tribal cultivator of Singhbum in Chotanagpur, became a rebel leader of the coal tribals of the region. 1.4 Rumors and Prophecies Rumors and prophecies played a part in moving people to action. As we saw, the sepoys who had arrived in Delhi from Meerut had told Bahadur Shah about bullets coated with the fat of cows and pigs and that biting those bullets would corrupt their caste and religion. They were referring to the cartridges of the Enfield rifles which had just been given to them. The British tried to explain to the sepoys that this was not the case but the rumor that the new cartridges were greased with the fat of cows and pigs spread like wildfire across the sepoy lines of North India. This is one rumor whose origin can be traced. Captain Wright, Commandant of the Rifle Instruction Depot, reported that in the third week of January 1857 a low-caste Colossi who worked in the magazine in Dum Dum had asked a Brahmin sepoy for a drink of water from his loda. The sepoy had refused saying that the lower caste's touch would defile the loda. The Colossi had reportedly retorted, you will soon lose your caste, 
as ere long you will have to bite cartridges covered with the fat of cows and pigs. We do not know the veracity of the report, but once this rumor started no amount of assurances from British officers could stop its circulation and the fear it spread among the sepoys. This was not the only rumor that was circulating in North India at the beginning of 1857. There was the rumor that the British government had hatched a gigantic conspiracy to destroy the caste and religion of Hindus and Muslims. To this end, the rumors said, the British had mixed the bone dust of cows and pigs into the flour that was sold in the market. In towns and cantonments, sepoys and the common people refused to touch the Atta. There was fear and suspicion that the British wanted to convert Indians to Christianity. Panic spread fast. British officers tried to allay their fears, but in vain. These fears stirred men to action. The response to the call for action was reinforced by the prophecy that British rule would come to an end on the centenary of the Battle of Plassey, on June 23, 1857. Rumors were not the only thing circulating at the time. Reports came from various parts of North India that chap Addis were being distributed from village to village. A person would come at night and give a chapati to the watchman of the village and ask him to make five more and distribute to the next village, and so on. The meaning and purpose of the distribution of the chap Addis was not clear and is not clear even today. But there is no doubt that people read it as an omen of an upheaval. 1.5 Why did people believe in the rumors? We cannot understand the power of rumors and prophecies in history by checking whether they are factually correct or not. We need to see what they reflect about the minds of people who believed them their fears and apprehensions, their faiths and convictions. Rumors circulate only when they resonate with the deeper fears and suspicions of people. The rumors in 1857 begin to make sense when seen in the context of the policies the British pursued from the late 1820s. As you know, from that time, under the leadership of Governor General Lord William Bentinck, the British adopted policies aimed at reforming Indian society by introducing Western education, Western ideas, and Western institutions. With the cooperation of sections of Indian society they set up English medium schools, colleges, and universities which taught Western sciences and the liberal arts. The British established laws to abolish customs like Sati, 1829, and to permit the remarriage of Hindu widows. On a variety of pleas, like misgovernment and the refusal to recognize adoption, the British annexed not only Awad, but many other kingdoms and principalities like Jhansi and Satara. Once these territories were annexed, the British introduced their own system of administration, their own laws and their own methods of land settlement and land revenue collection. The cumulative impact of all this on the people of North India was profound. It seemed to the people that all that they cherished and held sacred from kings and socio-religious customs to patterns of land holding and revenue payment was being destroyed and replaced by a system that was more impersonal, alien, and oppressive. This perception was aggravated by the activities of Christian missionaries. In such a situation of uncertainty, rumors spread with remarkable swiftness. To explore the basis of the revolt of 1857 in some detail, let us look at Awad one of the major centers where the drama of 1857 unfolded. I. 2. Awad in revolt. 2.1 A cherry that will drop into our mouth one day. In 1851 Governor General Lord Dalhousie described the kingdom of Awad as a cherry that will drop into our mouth one day. Five years later, in 1856, the kingdom was formally annexed to the British Empire. The conquest happened in stages. The subsidiary alliance had been imposed on Awad in 1801. By the terms of this alliance the Nawab had to disband his military force, allow the British to position their troops within the kingdom, and act in accordance with the advice of the British resident who was now to be attached to the court. Deprived of his armed forces, the Nawab became increasingly dependent on the British to maintain law and order within the kingdom. He could no longer assert control over the rebellious chiefs and Talukdars. In the meantime the British became increasingly interested in acquiring the territory of Awad. They felt that the soil there was good for producing indigo and cotton, and the region was ideally located to be developed into the principal market of Upper India. 
By the early 1850s, moreover, all the major areas of India had been conquered, the Maratha lands, the Dub, the Karnatik, the Punjab and Bengal. The takeover of Awad in 1856 was expected to complete a process of territorial annexation that had begun with the conquest of Bengal almost a century earlier. 2.2 The life was gone out of the body. Lord Dalhousie's annexations created disaffection in all the areas and principalities that were annexed but nowhere more so than in the kingdom of Awad in the heart of North India. Here, Nawabwajid Ali Shah was dethroned and exiled to Calcutta on the plea that the region was being misgoverned. The British government also wrongly assumed that Wajid Ali Shah was an unpopular ruler. On the contrary, he was widely loved, and when he left his beloved Lucknow, there were many who followed him all the way to Kanpur singing songs of lament. The widespread sense of grief and loss at the Nawab's exile was recorded by many contemporary observers. One of them wrote, the life was gone out of the body, and the body of this town had been left lifeless, there was no street or market and house which did not wail out the cry of agony in separation of Yanni Alam. One folk song bemoaned that the Honorable English came and took the country, Angres Bahadur An, Mulk Lai Lin Ho. This emotional upheaval was aggravated by immediate material losses. The removal of the Nawab led to the dissolution of the court and its culture. Thus a whole range of people musicians, dancers, poets, artisans, cooks, retainers, administrative officials and so on lost their livelihood. 2.3 Firji Raj and the End of a World A chain of grievances in Awad linked Prince, Talukdar, Peasant and Sepoy. In different ways they came to identify Firji Raj with the end of their world the breakdown of things they valued, respected and held dear. A whole complex of emotions and issues, traditions, and loyalties worked themselves out in the revolt of 1857. In Awad, more than anywhere else, the revolt became an expression of popular resistance to an alien order. The annexation displaced not just the Nawab. It also dispossessed the Talukdars of the region. The countryside of Awad was dotted with the estates and forts of Talukdars who for many generations had controlled land and power in the countryside. Before the coming of the British, Talukdars maintained armed retainers, built forts and enjoyed a degree of autonomy, as long as they accepted the suzerainty of the Nawab and paid the revenue of their Taluks. Some of the bigger Talukdars had as many as 12,000 foot soldiers and even the smaller ones had about 200. The British were unwilling to tolerate the power of the Talukdars. Immediately after the annexation, the Talukdars were disarmed. And their forts destroyed. The British land revenue policy further undermined the position and authority of the Talukdars. After annexation, the first British revenue settlement, known as the Summary Settlement of 1856, was based on the assumption that the Talukdars were interlopers with no permanent stakes in land they had established their hold over land through force and fraud. The summary settlement proceeded to remove the Talukdars wherever possible. Figures show that in pre-British times, Talukdars had held 67 percent of the total number of villages in Awad, by the summary settlement this number had come down to 38 percent. The Talukdars of southern Awad were the hardest hit and some lost more than half of the total number of villages they had previously held. British land revenue officers believed that by removing Talukdars they would be able to settle the land with the actual owners of the soil and thus reduce the level of exploitation of peasants while increasing revenue returns for the state. But this did not happen in practice, revenue flows for the state increased but the burden of demand on the peasants did not decline. Officials soon found that large areas of Awad were actually heavily overassessed. The increase of revenue demand in some places was from 30 to 70 percenter. Thus neither Talukdars nor peasants had any reasons to be happy with the annexation. The dispossession of Talukdars meant the breakdown of an entire social order. The ties of loyalty and patronage that had bound the peasant to the Talukdar were disrupted. In pre-British times, the Talukdars were oppressors but many of them also appeared to be generous father figures they exacted a variety of dues from the peasant but were often considerate in times of need. Now, under the British, the peasant was directly exposed to over-assessment of revenue and inflexible methods of collection. 
there was no longer any guarantee that in times of hardship or crop failure the revenue demand of the state would be reduced or collection postponed, or that in times of festivities the peasant would get the loan and support that the Talukdar had earlier provided. In areas like Awad where resistance during 1857 was intense and long-lasting, the fighting was carried out by Talukdars and their peasants. Many of these Talukdars were loyal to the Nawab of Awad, and they joined Begum Hezrat Mahal, the wife of the Nawab, in Lucknow to fight the British, some even remained with her in defeat. The grievances of the peasants were carried over into the Sepoy lines since a vast majority of the Sepoys were recruited from the villages of Awad. For decades the Sepoys had complained of low levels of pay and the difficulty of getting leave. By the 1850s there were other reasons for their discontent. The relationship of the Sepoys with their superior white officers underwent a significant change in the years preceding the uprising of 1857. In the 1820s, white officers made it a point to maintain friendly relations with the Sepoys. They would take part in their leisure activities they wrestled with them fenced with them and went out hawking with them. Many of them were fluent in Hindustani and were familiar with the customs and culture of the country. These officers were disciplinarian and father figure rolled into one. In the 1840s, this began to change. The officers developed a sense of superiority and started treating the sepoys as their racial inferiors, riding rushot over their sensibilities. Abuse and physical violence became common and thus the distance between sepoys and officers grew. Trust was replaced by suspicion. The episode of the greased cartridges was a classic example of this. It is also important to remember that close links existed between the sepoys and the rural world of North India. The large majority of the sepoys of the Bengal army were recruited from the villages of Awad and eastern Uttar Pradesh. Many of them were Brahmins or from the upper castes. Awad was, in fact, called the nursery of the Bengal army. The changes that the families of the sepoys saw around them and the threats they perceived were quickly transmitted to the sepoy lines. In turn, the fears of the sepoys about the new cartridge, their grievances about leave, their grouse about the increasing misbehavior and racial abuse on the part of their white officers were communicated back to the villages. This link between the sepoys and the rural world had important implications in the course of the uprising. When the sepoys defied their superior officers and took up arms they were joined very swiftly by their brethren in the villages. Everywhere, peasants poured into towns and joined the soldiers and the ordinary people of the towns in collective acts of rebellion. 3. What the rebels wanted. As victors, the British recorded their own trials and tribulations as well as their heroism. They dismissed the rebels as a bunch of ungrateful and barbaric people. The repression of the rebels also meant silencing of their voice. Few rebels had the opportunity of recording their version of events. Moreover, most of them were sepoys and ordinary people who were not literate. Thus, other than a few proclamations and ishtahars, notifications, issued by rebel leaders to propagate their ideas and persuade people to join the revolt, we do not have much that throws light on the perspective of the rebels. Attempts to reconstruct what happened in 1857 are thus heavily and inevitably dependent on what the British wrote. While these sources reveal the minds of officials, they tell us very little about what the rebels wanted. 3.1 The Vision of Unity The rebel proclamations in 1857 repeatedly appealed to all sections of the population, irrespective of their caste and creed. Many of the proclamations were issued by Muslim princes or in their names but even these took care to address the sentiments of Hindus. The rebellion was seen as a war in which both Hindus and Muslims had equally to lose or gain. The Ishtahars harked back to the pre-British Hindu-Muslim past and glorified the coexistence of different communities under the Mughal Empire. The proclamation that was issued under the name of Bahadur Shah appealed to the people to join the fight under the standards of both Muhammad and Mahavir. It was remarkable that during the uprising religious divisions between Hindus and Muslim were hardly noticeable despite British attempts to create such divisions. In Bareilly in western Uttar Pradesh, in December 1857, the British spent Rs. 50,000 to incite the Hindu population against the Muslims. The attempt failed. 
3.2 Against the Symbols of Oppression The proclamations completely rejected everything associated with British rule or Fergie Raj as they called it. They condemned the British for the annexations they had carried out and the treaties they had broken. The British, the rebel leaders said, could not be trusted. What enraged the people was how British land revenue settlements had dispossessed landholders, both big and small, and foreign commerce had driven artisans and weavers to ruin. Every aspect of British rule was attacked and the Fergie accused of destroying a way of life that was familiar and cherished. The rebels wanted to restore that world. The proclamations expressed the widespread fear that the British were bent on destroying the caste and religions of Hindus and Muslims and converting them to Christianity a fear that led people to believe many of the rumors that circulated at the time. People were urged to come together and fight to save their livelihood, their faith, their honor, their identity a fight which was for the greater public good. As noted earlier, in many places the rebellion against the British widened into an attack on all those who were seen as allies of the British or local oppressors. Often the rebels deliberately sought to humiliate the elites of a city. In the villages they burnt account books and ransacked moneylenders' houses. This reflected an attempt to overturn traditional hierarchies, rebel against all oppressors. It presents a glimpse of an alternative vision, perhaps of a more egalitarian society. Such visions were not articulated in the proclamations which sought to unify all social groups in the fight against Fergie. Raj. 3.3 The Search for Alternative Power Once British rule had collapsed, the rebels in places like Delhi, Lucknow and Kanpur tried to establish some kind of structure of authority and administration. This was, of course, short-lived but the attempts show that the rebel leadership wanted to restore the pre-British world of the 18th century. The leaders went back to the culture of the court. Appointments were made to various posts, arrangements made for the collection of land revenue and the payment of troops, orders issued to stop loot and plunder. Side-by-side -side plans were made to fight battles against the British. Chains of command were laid down in the army. In all this the rebels harked back to the 18th century Mughal world a world that became a symbol of all that had been lost. The administrative structures established by the rebels were primarily aimed at meeting the demands of war. However, in most cases these structures could not survive the British onslaught. But in Awad, where resistance to the British lasted longest, plans of counterattack were being drawn up by the Lucknow court and hierarchies of command were in place as late as the last months of 1857 and the early part of 1858. 4. Repression. It is clear from all accounts that we have of 1857 that the British did not have an easy time in putting down the rebellion. Before sending out troops to reconquer North India, the British passed a series of laws to help them quell the insurgency. By a number of acts, passed in May and June 1857, not only was the whole of North India put under martial law but military officers and even ordinary Britons were given the power to try and punish Indians suspected of rebellion. In other words, the ordinary processes of law and trial were suspended and it was put out that rebellion would have only one punishment death. Armed with these newly enacted special laws and the reinforcements brought in from Britain, the British began the task of suppressing the revolt. They, like the rebels, recognized the symbolic value of Delhi. The British thus mounted a two-pronged attack. One force moved from Calcutta into North India and the other from the Punjab which was largely peaceful to reconquer Delhi. British attempts to recover Delhi began in earnest in early June 1857 but it was only in late September that the city was finally captured. The fighting and losses on both sides were heavy. One reason for this was the fact that rebels from all over North India had come to Delhi to defend the capital. In the Gainagdic Plain too the progress of British reconquest was slow. The forces had to reconquer the area village by village. The countryside and the people around were entirely hostile. As soon as they began their counter-insurgency operations, the British realized that they were not dealing with a mere mutiny but an uprising that had huge popular support. In Awad, for example, a British official called Forsyth estimated that three-fourths of the adult male population was in rebellion. The area was brought under control only in March 1858 after protracted fighting. 
the British used military power on a gigantic scale. But this was not the only instrument they used. In large parts of present-day Uttar Pradesh, where big landholders and peasants had offered united resistance, the British tried to break up the unity by promising to give back to the big landholders their estates. Rebel landholders were dispossessed and the loyal rewarded. Many landholders died fighting the British or they escaped into Nepal where they died of illness or starvation. 5. Images of the Revolt How do we know about the revolt, about the activities of the rebels and the measures of repression that we have been discussing? As we have seen, we have very few records on the rebels' point of view. There are a few rebel proclamations and notifications, as also some letters that rebel leaders wrote. But historians till now have continued to discuss rebel actions primarily through accounts written by the British. Official accounts, of course, abound, colonial administrators and military men left their versions in letters and diaries, autobiographies, and official histories. We can also gauge the official mindset and the changing British attitudes through the innumerable memos and notes, assessments of situations, and reports that were produced. Many of these have now been collected in a set of volumes on mutiny records. These tell us about the fears and anxieties of officials and their perception of the rebels. The stories of the revolt that were published in British newspapers and magazines narrated in gory detail the violence of the mutineers and these stories inflamed public feelings and provoked demands of retribution and revenge. One important record of the mutiny is the pictorial images produced by the British and Indians, paintings, pencil drawings, etchings, posters, cartoons, bazaar prints. Let us look at some of them and see what they tell us. 5.1 Celebrating the Saviors British pictures offer a variety of images that were meant to provoke a range of different emotions and reactions. Some of them commemorate the British heroes who saved the English and repressed the rebels. Relief of Lucknow, painted by Thomas Jones Barker in 1859, is an example of this type. When the rebel forces besieged Lucknow, Henry Lawrence, the commissioner of Lucknow, collected the Christian population and took refuge in the heavily fortified residency. Lawrence was killed but the residency continued to be defended under the command of Colonel Inglis. On September 25 James Outram and Henry Havelock arrived, cut through the rebel forces, and reinforced the British garrisons. Twenty days later Colin Campbell, who was appointed as the new commander of British forces in India, came with his forces and rescued the besieged British garrison. In British accounts the siege of Lucknow became a story of survival, heroic resistance, and the ultimate triumph of British power. Barker's painting celebrates the moment of Campbell's entry. At the center of the canvas are the British heroes Campbell, Outram, and Havelock. The gestures of the hands of those around lead the spectators' eyes towards the center. The heroes stand on a ground that is well lit, with shadows in the foreground and the damaged residency in the background. The dead and injured in the foreground are testimony to the suffering during the siege, while the triumphant figures of horses in the middle ground emphasize the fact that British power and control had been re-established. To the British public such paintings were reassuring. They created a sense that the time of trouble was past and the rebellion was over, the British were the victors. 5.2 English Women and the Honour of Britain Newspaper reports have a power over public imagination they shape feelings and attitudes to events. Inflamed particularly by tales of violence against women and children, there were public demands in Britain for revenge and retribution. The British government was asked to protect the honor of innocent women and ensure the safety of helpless children. Artists expressed as well as shaped these sentiments through their visual representations of trauma and suffering. In Memoriam was painted by Joseph Noel Payton two years after the mutiny. You can see English women and children huddled in a circle, looking helpless and innocent, seemingly waiting for the inevitable dishonor, violence, and death. In Memoriam does not show gory violence, it only suggests it. It stirs up the spectator's imagination, and seeks to provoke anger and fury. It represents the rebels as violent and brutish, even though they remain invisible in the picture. In the background you can see the British rescue forces arriving as saviors. In another set of sketches and paintings we see women in a different light. 
They appear heroic, defending themselves against the attack of rebels. Miss Wheeler in figure 11.12 stands firmly at the center, defending her honor, single-handedly killing the attacking rebels. As in all such British representations, the rebels are demonized. Here, four burly males with swords and guns are shown. Attacking a woman. The woman's struggle to save her honor and her life, in fact, is represented as having a deeper religious connotation, it is a battle to save the honor of Christianity. The book lying on the floor is the Bible. 5.3 Vengeance and Retribution As waves of anger and shock spread in Britain, demands for retribution grew louder. Visual representations and news about the revolt created a milieu in which violent repression and vengeance were seen as both necessary and just. It was as if justice demanded that the challenge to British honor and power be met ruthlessly. Threatened by the rebellion, the British felt that they had to demonstrate their invincibility. In one such image we see an allegorical female figure of justice with a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. Her posture is aggressive, her face expresses rage and the desire for revenge. She is trampling sepoys under her feet while a mass of Indian women with children cower with fear. There were innumerable other pictures and cartoons in the British press that sanctioned brutal repression and violent reprisal. 5.4 The Performance of Terror The urge for vengeance and retribution was expressed in the brutal way in which the rebels were executed. They were blown from guns, or hanged from the gallows. Images of these executions were widely circulated through popular journals. 5.50 Time for Clemency at a time when the clamor was for vengeance, pleas for moderation were ridiculed. When Governor General Canning declared that a gesture of leniency and a show of mercy would help in winning back the loyalty of the sepoys, he was mocked in the British press. In one of the cartoons published in the pages of Punch, a British journal of comic satire, Canning is shown as a looming father figure, with his protective hand over the head of a sepoy who still holds an unsheathed sword in one hand and a dagger in the other both dripping with blood and imagery that recurs in a number of British pictures of the time. 5.6 Ationalist Imageries The national movement in the 20th century drew its inspiration from the events of 1857. A whole world of nationalist imagination was woven around the revolt. It was celebrated as the first war of independence in which all sections of the people of India came together to fight against imperial rule. Art and Literature as much as the writing of history, have helped in keeping alive the memory of 1857. The leaders of the revolt were presented as heroic figures leading the country into battle, rousing the people to righteous indignation against oppressive imperial rule. Heroic poems were written about the valor of the queen who, with the sword in one hand and the reins of her horse in the other, fought for the freedom of her motherland. Ronnie of Jhansi was represented as a masculine figure chasing the enemy, slaying British soldiers and valiantly fighting till her last. Children in many parts of India grow up reading the lines of Subhadra Kumari Chauhan, Kublari Mardani Wo to Jhansi Wali Rani Thi, like a man she fought, she was the Rani of Jhansi. In popular prints Rani Lakshmi Bai is usually portrayed in battle armor with a sword in hand and riding a horse a symbol of the determination to resist injustice and alien rule. The images indicate how the painters who produced them perceived those events, what they felt, and what they sought to convey. Through the paintings and cartoons we know about the public that looked at the paintings, appreciated or criticized the images, and bought copies and reproductions to put up in their homes. These images did not only reflect the emotions and feelings of the times in which they were produced. They also shaped sensibilities. Fed by the images that circulated in Britain, the public sanctioned the most brutal forms of repression of the rebels. On the other hand, nationalist imageries of the revolt helped shape the nationalist imagination. Timeline 1801 Subsidiary Alliance introduced by Wellesley in Awad 1856 Nawab Wajid Ali Shah deposed, Awad annexed. 1856 to 1857 Summary Revenue Settlements introduced in Awad by the British. 1857 May 10th Mutiny starts in Meerut. 
11 to May 12, Delhi Garrison's Revolt, Bahadur Shah accepts nominal leadership. 20 to May 27, Sepoys Mutiny in Aligarh, Etawa, Mainpuri, Ada. May 30, Rising in Lucknow. May June Mutiny turns into a general revolt of the people. June 30, British suffer defeat in the Battle of Chinyat. 25 September, British forces under Havelock and Outram enter the Residency in Lucknow. July Shah Mal killed in battle. 1858. June Rani Jhansi killed in battle. Through 12 and May 13, North India remained quiet. Once word spread that Delhi had fallen to the rebels and Bahadur Shah had blessed the rebellion, events moved swiftly. Cantonment after cantonment in the Gang Etik Valley and some to the west of Delhi rose in mutiny. Bell of Arms is a storeroom in which weapons are kept. Firji, a term of Persian origin, possibly derived from Frank, from which France gets its name, is used in Urdu and Hindi, often in a derogatory sense, to designate foreigners. Source 1. Ordinary Life in Extraordinary Times. What happened in the cities during the months of the revolt? How did people live through those months? Of tumult? How was normal life affected? Reports from different cities tell us about the breakdown in routine activities. Read these reports from the Delhi Urdu Akbar, June 14, 1857. The same thing is true for vegetables and saig, spinach. People have been found to complain that even katu, pumpkin, and bangan, brinjal, cannot be found in the bazaars. Potatoes and RV, yam, when available are of stale and rotten variety, stored from before by far-sighted kunjeras, vegetable growers. From the gardens inside the city some produce does reach a few places but the poor and the middle class can only lick their lips and watch them, as they are earmarked for the select. There is something else that needs attention which is causing a lot of damage to the people which is that the water carriers have stopped filling water. Poor shurfas, gentility are seen carrying water in pails on their shoulders and only then the necessary household tasks such as cooking, etc. can take place. The halal kiyars, righteous, have become harem kiyars, corrupt, many mohalas have not been able to earn for several days and if this situation continues then decay, death and disease will combine together to spoil the city's air and an epidemic will spread all over the city and even to areas adjacent and around. Source 2 Sisson and the Tasildar. In the context of the communication of the message of revolt and mutiny, the experience of Francois Sisson, a native Christian police inspector in Siddhapur, is telling. He had gone to Saharanpur to pay his respects to the magistrate. Sisson was dressed in Indian clothes and sitting cross-legged. A Muslim Tasildar from Bijanur entered the room, upon learning that Sisson was from Awad, he inquired, What news from Awad? How does the work progress, brother? Playing safe, Sisson replied, If we have work in Awad, your highness will know it. The Tasildar said, Depend upon it, we will succeed this time. The direction of the business is in able hands. The Tasildar was later identified as the principal rebel leader of Bijanur. Mutiny a collective disobedience of rules and regulations within the armed forces. Revolt or rebellion of people against established authority and power. The terms revolt and rebellion can be used synonymously. In the context of the revolt of 1857 the term revolt refers primarily to the uprising of the civilian population, peasants, zamindars, rajas, jajirdars, while the mutiny was of the sepoys. Two rebels of 1857. Shamal. Shamal lived in a large village in Pargana Baraut in Uttar Pradesh. He belonged to a clan of Jat cultivators whose kinship ties extended over Shrezi Day, 84 villages. The lands in the region were irrigated and fertile, with rich dark loam soil. Many of the villagers were prosperous and saw the British land revenue system as oppressive, the revenue demand was high and its collection inflexible. Consequently cultivators were losing land to outsiders, to traders and moneylenders who were coming into the area. Shamal mobilized the headmen and cultivators of Shrezi Day, moving at night from village to village, 
urging people to rebel against the British. As in many other places, the revolt against the British turned into a general rebellion against all signs of oppression and injustice. Cultivators left their fields and plundered the houses of moneylenders and traders. Displaced proprietors took possession of the lands they had lost. Shah Mal's men attacked government buildings, destroyed the bridge over the river, and dug up metalled roads partly to prevent government forces from coming into the area, and partly because bridges and roads were seen as symbols of British rule. They sent supplies to the sepoys who had mutinied in Delhi and stopped all official communication between British headquarters and Meerut. Locally acknowledged as the Raja, Shah Mal took over the bungalow of an English officer, turned it into a hall of justice, settling disputes and dispensing judgments. He also set up an amazingly effective network of intelligence. For a period the people of the area felt that Firji Raj was over, and their Raj had come. Shah Mao was killed in battle in July 1857. Malvi Ahmadullah Shah Malvi Ahmadullah Shah was one of the many Malvis who played an important part in the revolt of 1857. Educated in Hyderabad, he became a preacher when young. In 1856, he was seen moving from village to village preaching jihad, religious war, against the British and urging people to rebel. He moved in a palanquin, with drumbeaters in front and followers at the rear. He was therefore popularly called Donka Shah the Malvi with the drum, Donka. British officials panicked as thousands began following the Malvi and many Muslims began seeing him as an inspired prophet. When he reached Lucknow in 1856, he was stopped by the police from preaching in the city. Subsequently, in 1857, he was jailed in Faisabad. When released, he was elected by the mutinous 22nd Native Infantry as their leader. He fought in the famous Battle of Chinyat in which the British forces under Henry Lawrence were defeated. He came to be known for his courage and power. Many people in fact believed that he was invincible, had magical powers, and could not be killed by the British. It was this belief that partly formed the basis of his authority. As Governor-General, Hardinge attempted to modernize the equipment of the army. The Enfield rifles that were introduced initially used the greased cartridges the sepoys rebelled against. Resident was the designation of a representative of the Governor-General who lived in a state which was not under direct British rule. Subsidiary Alliance Subsidiary Alliance was a system devised by Lord Wellesley in 1798. All those who entered into such an alliance with the British had to accept certain terms and conditions. The British would be responsible for protecting their ally from external and internal threats to their power. 1. In the territory of the ally, a British armed contingent would be stationed. 2. The ally would have to provide the resources for maintaining this contingent. 3. The ally could enter into agreements with other rulers or engage in warfare only with the permission of the British. Source 3. The Awab has left. Another song mourned the plight of the ruler who had to leave his motherland. Noble and peasant all wept together and all the world wept and wailed alas. The chief has bidden adieu to his country and gone abroad. Read the entire section and discuss why people mourn the departure of Wajid Ali Shah. Source 4. What Talukdars thought. The attitude of the Talukdars was best expressed by Hanwant Singh, the Raja of Kalakankar, near Ray Bareilly. During the mutiny, Hanwant Singh had given shelter to a British officer, and conveyed him to safety. While taking leave of the officer, Hanwant Singh told him. Saib, your countrymen came into this country and drove out our king. You sent your officers round the districts to examine the titles to the estates. At one blow you took from me lands which from time immemorial had been in my family. I submitted. Suddenly misfortune fell upon you. The people of the land rose against you. You came to me whom you had despoiled. I have saved you. But now now I march at the head of my retainers to luck now to try and drive you from the country. What does this excerpt tell you about the attitude of the Talukdars? Who did Han Wan Singh mean by the people of the land? What reason does Han Wan Singh give for the anger of the people? 
Source 5. The Azamgar Proclamation, August 25, 1857. This is one of the main sources of our knowledge about what the rebels wanted. It is well known to all, that in this age the people of Hindustan, both Hindus and Mohammedans, are being ruined under the tyranny and the oppression of the infidel and treacherous English. It is therefore the bounden duty of all the wealthy people of India, especially those who have any sort of connection with the Mohammedan royal families, and are considered the pastors and masters of their people, to stake their lives and property for the well-being of the public. Several of the Hindu and Musalman chiefs, who have long since quitted their homes for the preservation of their religion, and have been trying their best to root out the English in India, have presented themselves to me, and taken part in the reigning Indian crusade, and it is more than probable that I shall very shortly receive succors from the West. Therefore for the information of the public, the present Ishtahar, consisting of several sections, is put in circulation and it is the imperative duty of all to take into their careful consideration, and abide by it. Parties anxious to participate in the common cause, but having no means to provide for themselves, shall receive their daily subsistence from me, and be it known to all, that the ancient works, both of the Hindus and Mohammedans, the writings of miracle workers, and the calculation of the astrologers, pundits, all agree in asserting that the English will no longer have any footing in India or elsewhere. Therefore it is incumbent on all to give up the hope of the continuation of the British sway, side with me, and deserve the consideration of the Badshahi, or imperial government, by their individual exertion in promoting the common good, and thus attain their respective ends, otherwise if this golden opportunity slips away, they will have to repent for their folly. Section I Regarding Zemindars It is evident, that the British government in making Zemindari settlements have imposed exorbitant jumas, revenue demand, and have disgraced and ruined several Zemindars, by putting up their estates for public auction for arrears of rent, in so much, in the institution of a suit by a common riot, a maid servant, or a slave, the respectable Zemindars are summoned into court, arrested, put in goal and disgraced. In litigation regarding Zemindaries, the immense value of stamps, and other unnecessary expenses of the civil courts, are all calculated to impoverish the litigants. Besides this, the coffers of the Zemindars are annually taxed with the subscription for schools, hospitals, roads, etc. Such extortions will have no manner of existence in the Badshahi government, but on the contrary the Jumas will be light, the dignity and honor of the Zemindars safe, and every Zemindar will have absolute rule in his own Zemindari. Section 2 Regarding Merchants it is plain that the infidel and treacherous British government have monopolized the trade of all the fine and valuable merchandise, such as indigo, cloth and other articles of shipping, leaving only the trade of trifles to the people. Besides this, the profits of the traders are taxed, with postages, tolls and subscriptions for schools, etc. Notwithstanding all these concessions, the merchants are liable to imprisonment and disgrace at the instance or complaint of a worthless man. When the Badshahi government is established all these aforesaid fraudulent practices shall be dispensed with, and the trade of every article, without exception, both by land and water will be opened to the native merchants of India. It is therefore the duty of every merchant to take part in the war, and aid the Badshahi government with his men and money. Section 3 Regarding Public Servants It is not a secret thing, that under the British government, Natives employed in the civil and military services have little respect, low pay and no manner of influence, and all the posts of dignity and emolument in both the departments are exclusively bestowed on Englishmen. Therefore, all the natives in the British service ought to be alive to their religion and interest, and abjuring their loyalty to the English, side with the Badshahi government, and obtain salaries of 200 and 300 rupees a month for the present, and be entitled to high posts in the future. Section 4 Regarding Artisans It is evident that the Europeans, by the introduction of English articles into India, have thrown the weavers, the cotton dressers, the carpenters, the blacksmiths and the shoemakers, etc., out of employ, and have engrossed their occupations, so that every description of native artisan has been reduced to beggary. But under the Badshahi government the native artisans will exclusively be employed in the service of the kings, the rajas, and the rich, 
and this will no doubt ensure their prosperity. Therefore these artisans ought to renounce the English services. Section 5 Regarding Pundits, Fakirs, and Other Learned Persons The Pundits and Fakirs being the guardians of the Hindu and Mohammedan religions respectively, and the Europeans being the enemies of both the religions, and as at present a war is raging against the English on account of religion, the Pundits and Fakirs are bound to present themselves to me, and take their share in the Holy War. Source 6 What the Sepoys Thought This is one of the Arzas, petition or application, of rebel sepoys that have survived. A century ago the British arrived in Hindustan and gradually entertained troops in their service, and became masters of every state. Our forefathers have always served them, and we also entered their service. By the mercy of God and with our assistance the British also conquered every place they liked, in which thousands of us, Hindustani men were sacrificed but we never made any excuses or pretenses nor revolted. But in the year 1857 the British issued an order that new cartridges and muskets which had arrived from England were to be issued, in the former of which the fats of cows and pigs were mixed, and also that atta of wheat mixed with powdered bones was to be eaten, and even distributed them in every regiment of infantry, cavalry, and artillery. They gave these cartridges to the sours, mounted soldiers, of the third light cavalry, and ordered them to bite them, the troopers objected to it, and said that they would never bite them, for if they did, their religion and faith would be destroyed, upon this the British officers paraded the men of the three regiments and having prepared 1,400 English soldiers, and other battalions of European troops and horse artillery, surrounded them, and placing six guns before each of the infantry regiments, loaded the guns with grape and made 84 new troopers prisoners, and put them in jail with irons on them. The reason that the sours of the cantonment were put into jail was that we should be frightened into biting the new cartridges. On this account we and all our countrymen having united together, have fought the British for the preservation of our faith, we have been compelled to make war for two years and the Rajas and chiefs who are with us in faith and religion, are still so, and have undergone all sorts of trouble, we have fought for two years in order that our faith and religion may not be polluted. If the religion of a Hindu or Musalman is lost, what remains in the world? Source 7 Villagers as